Good morning and welcome to our next nonprofit forum, Cultivating from the Inside, Internal Candidate Identification. We're welcoming back Carrie Millard and Lindsay Steinberg from Millard Consulting. Before we bring them on, we want to cover a little of the basics. Uh, this webinar is being recorded this morning, and that means that the recording will be accessible to you after the conclusion of the forum. It will be sent to the email inbox that you use to register for this forum, along with a link to a Dropbox uh, account that will allow you to access materials that are associated with the whole entire series. We hope that you will join us for the duration of this series, um, and all of those materials are accessible to you in that Dropbox account. If you can't join us for every single session, not to worry, each of these sessions can be found on our YouTube channel. Um, if you go to the Columbus Foundation YouTube channel, you will find a nonprofit forum playlist there. If you are in need of live captioning, please take a look at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen where it says show captions. If you click there, the captions should appear. If you need to adjust the captions, click on the carrot and it will allow you to access the settings. We use the chat box in these forums to report technical issues that happen. So if you have trouble with the volume, if you can't seem to get your closed captioning up, anything like that, it's a great reason to use the chat box. If you have content related questions for the presenters today, please place those in the Q&A box. That box will be monitored throughout the duration of the forum. Do go through and check out those questions though and upvote the questions that you feel most pertain to you. That'll help me know during the Q&A session which questions are a priority. With regard to the chat box, we love to have conversation in that chat box. So feel free to leave commentary for your peers or information that you know, it's a great place to share. Um, so with that, let's introduce Carrie Millard and Lindsay Steinberg. Carrie is the founder and CEO of Millard Consulting. She's a respected authority on nonprofit board governance, planning and fundraising. In her 27 year career in the nonprofit sector, it includes roles of public relations, fundraising and executive leadership. She also serves as an elected, an elected office as Plain Township Trustee. Carrie has a master's degree in Indiana University and a bachelor's degree from the Ohio State University. She also has a certification in nonprofit board consulting from BoardSource. Lindsay has been Senior Director of Client Management at Millard Consulting since 2015. She's a respected leader in nonprofit management, board governance, fundraising, and planning. She's client-centered with strong training and communication skills and extensive experience working in a variety of sectors. Welcome to the stage, Lindsay and Carrie. Thank you, Danielle. Hello, everybody. It's um, nice to see you, even though we're in this artificial environment. I'm going to start to share my screen here. So give me one second. So <clears throat> it is a pleasure to join you in this forum, um, which is our third one um, of the series. And as a reminder, as Danielle said, all the other forums, if you miss them, are stored on the YouTube channel and information is in the Dropbox. So for those who are new to the series, Millard Consulting is committed to having programs like this because at the end of the day, our mission is about building the capacity of nonprofit organizations and the individuals who serve them. So we're thrilled to have you here today. Great, so we're gonna start with a couple poll questions um, as we have done previously. So um, this you know, session is focused on internal identification primarily. So our first question here is, are there any staff members interested in being the next chief executive of your organization? Okay, wow, so a very even split here. So 30% yes, 20% uh, said no, um, but then you know, 50% there are maybe or unsure. Um, so we'll talk through that identification process more today. The next poll question is, 
Has your organization identified any internal staff members that would be a candidate, a potential candidate for the chief executive role? And Lindsay, and I would add, this is a little bit different than the first question, because this is about identifying versus just knowing someone's interested. Yep. So interesting. Okay. So 50% said yes, but only 30% said there was a staff member interested in the role. So that's an interesting difference in percentages there. 20% uh, no, 30% maybe, and then no one was unsure. Um, so really interesting. And we'll, we'll talk throughout about, you know, as Carrie just noted, the, the importance of the word identification versus selection. Um, and then what you do in these instances where there is someone who's interested and identified. Or the opposite. <laughs> Correct. Um, okay, our last poll question uh, for now, are any board members interested in serving as a successor to the current chief executive? Great. So um, this, you know, this, and this aligns, you know, people tend to not think of board members often as, as often in this potential candidate position. So 10% yes, 60% um, said no, um, but then, you know, almost a third were unsure. And this scenario can be very tricky. And as Lindsay said, we'll talk through the details of this, but this can become, as you all can imagine, um, really a tricky situation to navigate. Um, we are going to do our quick level set of succession planning assessment for those of you who are new to this series. So as a reminder, the hyperlink on SurveyMonkey remains live. So anyone who would like to do an electronic version of the assessment, you're welcome to do that. A PDF version of the assessment is in the Dropbox folder for you to use um, with your board, with your senior staff. So please know at any time you're welcome to do that. And at any time, if you have questions about the assessment, Lindsay or I are happy to answer those. The other level set that we'll do quickly for those who are new to the series are just a few reminders of key points about succession planning. So fundamentally, succession planning is an extension of strategic planning, and it is a board responsibility. So if you're a chief executive and the board has told you, you have to do this, this is really ultimately a responsibility of board governance. Number two, succession planning is not synonymous with executive transition and search. Planning is best done, in the, as we're saying here in number three, when leadership is stable and the organization is not yet in that transition phase or an active search process. So this is about planning. It is an extension of board governance. It does not mean that a search is, is pending or impending. Um, and then number four, remember, not all departures are planned. You may be thinking about retiring in several years, but we always start with emergency preparedness because something can happen that is not planned and the organization needs to be prepared and ready to manage that. And then other quick reminders, these are the transition scenarios. Retirement, which is the most common and happy. Um, resignation with advance notice can also be happy, right? Someone who gets promoted or recruited away to a larger institution. Resignation with little notice is often not happy, often unplanned. Um, a sabbatical, um, especially in this environment of um, fatigue and burnout, a, a sabbatical is often planned. Termination is um, typically never happy <laughs> and not something planned in advance. A leave of absence can be happy, such as a maternity leave, and you have months to plan for that. Or if there was a medical condition like a heart attack, it would be unplanned, sudden, and again, do you have the emergency plan in place? And then, of course, um, your chief executive may pass away, and is the organization prepared for that? So those are all of our reminders, and we'll dive now into internal candidates. Great, so we're gonna walk through um, several considerations when thinking about internal candidates and the process um, behind that. So the first one here um, is just, you know, important you know, reminder that the word identification is not the same as selection. So candidate identification is not the same as selecting a candidate. 
You don't want to tie the hands of a future board by making promises internally today um, that may be promises that the board is not going to keep tomorrow when it comes to um, selecting a chief executive. On the other side of that, candidate rejection should not occur during a succession planning process either. Um, that is left for the search process itself. Um, so, you know, individuals really shouldn't be promised this role. This is a board responsibility. The number, if you remember, we did a um, recap of board roles and responsibilities in one of our sessions and selecting the chief executive is a top responsibility for the board. So the, selecting internally a future candidate now is really not appropriate because the board, you know, down the line may not agree with that candidate selection. It's also important to remember that someone who's the best fit for an organization today very well may not be the best fit for the organization in the future whenever the search and the transition happens. There are so many variables internally and externally that can dramatically change um, the context of the organization and the search. So it's really um, not wise to make a promise to any individuals today. That does not mean that you can't seek out if individuals are interested in being a potential candidate, you certainly can have those conversations and we encourage that. We'll talk about here in a minute how you should be documenting those conversations, but we're not making any promises ahead of time. And then also just important that on the flip side piece there, you know, if a potential candidate or a leadership says that they may be interested down the road in being the chief executive, they should never be shut down before a search process even happens. You know, you don't want to tell someone that they wouldn't make the cut or they're not, you know, material to be CEO. Um, one, again, you're making a decision that the future board needs to make. And two, you're really gonna demoralize that candidate and that staff member. Um, and we've seen employees leave when they're told that they don't have a future in a leadership or an executive position at an organization. So you certainly don't wanna damage the staff morale. Yeah. And Lindsay, I'll just add to that really quickly. For especially for the board members who are on this webinar, one single board member can't make a decision, right? That entire board has the authority to make a decision. And you know, when Lindsay was talking about rejection and morale, it, it happened to a colleague of ours and, and one board member told the staff member, like, don't even apply, you're never gonna be considered. And, and so that one board member took away the authority of the full board and also really damaged a, a relationship and a really promising, talented staff member. Um, so again, one board member can't make that decision either. Um, and the second one, it, you know, feeds off of the first one, right? This, it's not the chief executive's choice or decision on who succeeds them. Chief executives do not have the power to choose their own successor, and they should never be promising that role to anyone, um, including your most talented senior staff members. Now, this certainly doesn't mean that the chief executive can't work on professional development goals with leaders, help identify potential candidates down the road. But again, it's not their job to select them. And if there's a healthy relationship with the board, you know, the board is, is likely going to trust and very much value the chief executive's opinion on who could be a, you know, a good potential internal candidate. But, it, you know, that decision just does not lay within the executive director's um, hands. And Lindsay, I know we had a client one time and the executive director said to said to us, well, as soon as I've identified who I want to hand this off to, um, then I'll then I know I'm ready to you know move on. And it, and it was just such a false notion. So be wary with that. And you know we've we've talked about this in past um, forums as well. That I think too this is this looks a little different on the for profit side. So sometimes for board members that sit in the for profit world for their jobs, this is a little bit tricky. Um, while on the for profit side, you may not be promising a candidate either. There's a lot more grooming and public grooming that happens in the for profit sphere that really you don't see as much in the nonprofit. Um, so just keep in mind that it does sometimes look a little different. The third one here is that the board should understand the bench strength and the leadership of the organization and build a rapport with senior staff members, which only just deepens the engagement and it fosters the preparedness for future transitions when they come about. So, you know, a critical part of succession planning is ensuring that the talent pipeline is there for leadership positions. 
Um, and so that the executive director, the chief executive should be communicating with the board as they see talent. You know, it shouldn't be a surprise if, if a transition happens when an ED suggests a talent to the board or a potential candidate that's internal. Um, you know, we've seen clients where this has happened, where there's a chief executive that um, is, has announced a transition and they've brought forth an internal candidate and the board is surprised to hear the name. Not that they didn't know this was um, a talented person, but this, these conversations just hadn't happened before. Um, so this communication should be an ongoing so that the board can really understand the leadership and the bench of um, the organization. Yeah, and leader, uh, Lindsay, I'll add a story. We were facilitating a board retreat, and at the start of the board retreat, one of the board members said, well, before we begin, can I have the staff introduce themselves because this is the first time we've ever met them? And it was, you know, like a really jarring, like, what, right? What, what is happening here? And in further conversations, the chief executive was the only one who was going to board meetings, occasionally with the chief financial officer. And it wasn't so much of a, like a command and control type atmosphere. It was the chief executive was trying to protect the staff because they were so busy. It was a direct service, human service organization. The staff was working crazy hours. So she was really trying to like say, okay, I'll take care of the board. That doesn't have to be on your plate. But as Lindsay was saying, that was really to the detriment of the board that they didn't know them. And, and so should a future transition happen unexpectedly, um, the, the board would be flat-footed. Great, so number four is about not making assumptions. So you don't want to assume that senior staff members want to be the chief executive someday. And if there are some that are interested in a future, future chief executive role, it may be for a different organization. Um, and we see this a lot. I think the assumption is that everybody wants to be at the top. And there are people that love being a number two. We have an organization we work with where there is there is an individual who is hesitant to take the associate executive director role because they're fearful that that means that they would automatically be assumed to be the executive director once the current executive director leaves. So there shouldn't be those kind of assumptions. Some people love being the number two, that's where they're comfortable um, and that's okay. So um, we've also seen that, you know, that some people will say, I wanna be a chief executive, but I don't know that this organization is the right fit for me in that role. So I wanna learn all that I can here. Um, and then I'm gonna to wanna to take those skills down the road um, to a different organization. And that should also be supported as well. That's right. The fifth one here is um, it is possible that a senior staff member sees themselves as the next chief executive, but the board may not agree. Um, so, you know, my, my first question to, in this scenario would be, why do they see themselves this way? Right. How did we get here? Um, it should really be understood that there is not selection happening in advance of any transition. So my first question is be why do they see themselves there this way? And we've seen a lot of fabulous executive directors and chief executives that are very harmonious. They don't like conflict. And this is certainly an uncomfortable situation where you have leadership on your staff that would like to be the chief executive that have made that known. Um, and you don't wanna upset them, right? As we talked about, you don't wanna ruin the morale. So you're certainly not gonna tell them that they aren't a good fit but you also shouldn't allow them going on thinking that they are the next successor. So again, it should be established early on that there's no selection ahead of a transition happening. Identification is, is absolutely fine. Um, and then also it's important that the you know a relationship between a senior staff member and the executive director can look very different than that senior staff member's relationship with the board members, um, with external people. So the board may see that individual differently than the current executive director sees them. Yeah, and Lindsay, I'll add, you know, you were saying how, you know, why does the senior staff member see themselves as this, but also then why does the board not see this person in that role? Right. And those honest, crucial conversations are important. They can be done, you know, in a very collegial, nurturing way to talk about growth and leadership development. Um, but these honest conversations, the sooner they happen, the better. And the sooner a plan for, for growth and opportunities can be developed, the better. Yeah. Number six is uh, sometimes a board member sees themselves as the next chief executive, which is you know, a less typical scenario, but certainly one that can happen. Um, so it's important for an organization to determine how the scenario would be addressed, 
um, and what policies and practices are going to be in place and need to be established um, to address the circumstance if it arises. So the first thing is if a board member, if a transition is happening or being announced, uh, and a board member is interested in the role, they need to resign. Um, and not only do they need to resign, but this needs to be a policy that's set in advance so that when the time comes, um, it takes out the kind of any personality conflict and the personal nature of it by saying, you know, you know, as a board member, you need to step down, you know, and it makes it them feel like that they are personally being um, singled out in some way. This should be a blanket policy that if there is a board member who becomes a candidate or is interested in being a candidate in the chief executive role or any internal leadership role that they must resign from the board. It's just not fair. It's not fair to the person who gets hired if that board member does not get hired to have them still on the board. It just creates all sorts of situations. Um, but I think it's important, you know, this isn't during planning, right? This is actually if they want to become a candidate. That's right. So the seventh one is really important here. Embed succession planning and candidate identification questions into your existing employee reviews. You should be creating a systematic way to regularly gauge and document a senior staff member's interest in and ability to become a potential chief executive candidate. And this documentation is really critical. I mean, these should be embedded into annual reviews. When we do um, succession planning for clients, we actually will take their existing review form and help embed questions into the existing form so that it's formally being documented as you go. You're documenting, is this senior staff member interested in this, in this role? Um, what professional development goals and needs do that need to be addressed for them to continue to grow in order to be ready for a chief executive type role? So the reason this is so critical is then when it comes time for succession planning or transit, I'm sorry, transition planning, these documented notes can then be passed on. So when you have an employee, let's say that think, you know, as the prior one was saying, that thinks that they're the next chief executive, you can take out the personal nature here. You'd say, I will be happy to pass on our documented notes from all of our employee reviews that show your interest and your ability to potentially become this person and I'll pass on the notes. So that documentation really takes out the personal nature um, of the internal piece. Um, and it, and it's, it's become a huge value add for the clients we work with. Those that have not been documenting this along the way, it's a much harder position for the current executive director to be in because then it's, their, it's just their word, right? It's their word to the committee on how they feel about an employee as opposed to formal documentation of them. Um, and it's interesting, We've been asked before, what if a uh, senior leadership person asks the chief executive to endorse them in a process, um, which could happen, especially if that senior staff member feels that they are the next chief executive. So the answer to that question is no. Um, and you can say no, but once again, I would be happy to pass on all of our notes from our reviews that show you know, the progress you've made to your professional development goals. Um, and the other thing that you could offer as a chief executive in a situation where they're asking for an endorsement and you know you can't do that is you could potentially be, as a chief executive, a reference for senior leadership. So if they said, would you be a reference for me? Um, that's a little bit different because references, as you know, can be good and bad. They're going to talk about strengths and challenges of, of a potential candidate. So a reference is one thing, but an endorsement is not okay. And that's such an important distinction. It's so important. It, and it can create so many internal political issues. So then the eighth one here, the last one is about more about this professional development. So use the succession planning process to build leadership development goals for each member of the senior staff. Create training plans and mentoring relationships for their professional growth. So you're identifying professional growth goals in their existing you know, annual reviews, and then you're helping develop additional leadership development goals for your senior staff members. Um, you know, this, of course, is just going to help your employees advance. This documents for future search committee and the board areas of strength and, and work for individual employees. It shows their progress towards the goals. And then when the time comes and those you know, professional development notes and goals can be passed on to the board and to a search committee, then they can decide if these professional development goals are insurmountable or they're beyond what the organization's ready to take on, or if the, if the individual has perhaps progressed in a way that they feel comfortable with them being a candidate. But this way, this, those goals help, you know, the future committee, search committee, make those decisions.
That's right. That's right. We'll use this as a segue to dive into this part now um, more, because for all of you on the webinar, we really want you to be able to walk away with some tangible, how do you do this? If you're the chief executive, how do you do this with your senior staff? So it's just a reminder of the importance of mentoring, right? Every chief executive is of course the organizational leader. You are the face of the organization but you're also the face of the staff, right? You are the leader of the staff and your internal team dynamics are really important. It's about the effectiveness of the organization and the health of the organization. So when a staff member expresses an interest in saying, I would like to be a, an executive director one day. And as Lindsay said, they might say, I'd like to be the executive director of a small organization one day, you know, not this organization, or, you know, if they see themselves staying at your organization and growing, that is such a unique moment, right? That is such a unique opportunity to develop this relationship with them, especially when someone shows tremendous promise. And I will tell you very early in my career, um, I had some, some leaders, you know, you know, speak to me and talk to me because they did see promise in me. And those were formative conversations. And really, um, you know, who knows what the arc of my career would have looked like if I didn't feel that, if I didn't sense that, that others saw um, promise in me and wanted to invest time in me. Um, and so we just think this mentoring role is so important. Um, and so, as Lindsay was saying, you can have a professional development plan that's part of a very formal process, part of the review process. And as Lindsay was saying, right, document it, operationalize it in the review. For those of you who are chief executives, if you're only doing annual performance reviews, we wanna encourage you to think about quarterly conversations, right? There's a lot that happens in one year in the life of an organization. There's also a lot that happens in one year in the life of a staff member. So having you know, quarterly conversations with your senior staff, with your direct reports, I'm embedding talking about professional development in those conversations. Um, so you can have a formal connection like in a performance review and talk about that or an informal. So you know, do you bring that staff member to certain meetings with you? Do you elevate them externally? Do you allow them to have a podium opportunity, you know, where they speak at the Columbus Metropolitan Club instead of you speak or something like that, right? Do you allow this person to share stories in a board meeting? Um, do you, you know, approach them and say, hey, here's this opportunity or challenge that I'm wrestling with. Do you wanna think through this with me? Let's have lunch and talk about it. I'd love to get your perspective. And board members can play that, can play that role too. I was sharing uh, with Lindsay, again, early in my career, it was my supervisor who saw promise in me and she went to the executive director and said, I'd love to think about how do we mentor Carrie more? How do we elevate her? And then suddenly I got a call from a board member who said, I'd love to take you for lunch. I've heard a lot about you. I'd love to hear about your background. I'd love to hear about your goals. To this day, right, you know, 30 years later, right? I mean, I remember that conversation as if it was yesterday. These are very formative conversations. You can make a big impact on someone. And those of you who are on the call on the Zoom, if you're a board member, you can play a role in this too. Now do that in connection with your chief executive and your staff. Don't you know, do that kind of rogue on your own, but think about the importance of that. And I think Carrie is uh, everything you said is so valuable, but also just remember though, even though it's informal, it's still not a, it's still not a formal grooming process, right? It's still yeah. not a promise um, for succession. You can mentor um, and push them towards growth goals um, without promising them that they're going to be the next chief executive, right? So it's still a, it can be a fine line. Yes. Thank you for that reminder. Please, chief executives, board members on this call, do not make that promise. It is it only typically what we have seen sets up really difficult situations, but investing in their growth, absolutely. And then, you know, as just a reminder of, you know, this kind of work environment that we're all in, right? I mean, we, the great resignation, quiet quitting, you know, you know, the unprecedented wage growth. Um, I mean, Lindsay and I, we've worked with, with some of you and our clients who have said to us, that you're losing employees because they can make more money working at Target, right? We are 
dealing with an unprecedented labor market right now. There are workforce disruptions that all of us are managing that um, three years ago, you know, four years ago, we weren't. And, and then on top of that, the waves of retirement. So this is time well spent. And you know, those of you who are chief executives and you're saying to yourself, I barely have time to brush my teeth, never mind start mentoring three people on my team, right? Like we also know, we know how busy you are, but we promise you that this will be time well spent um, for you and for your, your team. And I think on top of all that is just the exhaustion right from the pandemic too. I mean, I don't think it's a coincidence that we've seen this wave of succession planning work um, and leaders looking at transition because of the burnout that they've all been through and we've all been through, um, you know, post pandemic. Yeah. In fact, I talked to a chief executive this morning about um, this person's desire to take a sabbatical. Um, you know, sabbatical we listed is one of the transition scenarios. And there's a social service agency in Cleveland called Providence House. And they, because of this fatigue that Lindsay's talking about, they've now instituted a policy of sabbatical time for certain years of service to the organization because we have to recognize that, that the fatigue, the exhaustion, the burnout is real. Um, so, you know, core competencies. We're talking about leadership development. We're talking about embedding this into performance reviews. So, you know, how do you do that? What is the structure that you put around it? Because it can sound kind of squishy, right? You know, hey, dear staff person, let's just talk about your leadership growth. So there are six core competencies that every executive director should have. So we want to give that to you as some structure so that you can put learning goals around these and put some framework into these conversations with your team. Right. So, for instance, you might have someone who is really great at operations, but they want to learn, you know, you know, learn fundraising. How does it work? Or someone in communications who wants to learn about finance. So we reviewed these core competencies on a previous forum. So we'll go through them kind of quickly here today. But we again, this can give you the structure that you need. And these core competencies are from board source. So the first core competency for any nonprofit CEO is planning, the ability to understand how to prepare for the future. Fundraising, the ability to meet financial goals so that you can carry out the mission. Administration, you know, being responsible for day-to-day -day operations, understanding how to keep the lights on and the doors open. Board relations, right? Developing and maintaining relationships for effective board governance. This is of utmost importance because the number one role and responsibility of a chief executive is that relationship with the board. It's the most important relationship in the organization. Communications and PR, right? Any chief executive is the spokesperson of the face of the organization. Financial management, right? Are the resources managed wisely? Are you managing the budget? Does this person understand how to read a balance sheet? Oops, those things. Um, Oh, sorry, I skipped ahead. Sorry, sorry about that. So these are the ones that you can embed into the performance review to give that structure. And I think too, with those competencies, it's important to remember that not everyone is going to be it's the strong in all of them. They're, it's a diverse mix of competencies. So it's also important for an organization to kind of prioritize those a little bit if they can. Um, perhaps there's a fabulous you know, CFO there who handles the finances, then that's maybe going to be less of a priority for the chief executive to have that competency or for another individual on the staff leadership to have a competency. So important to prioritize them and also remember that not everyone is going to be super strong in all of them, but should be familiar with the full list of competencies. Yeah. And if you create a, so th use those as your structure for the leadership development conversations okay. and then create a structure in your organization, you know, one month out of the year will be a big performance review month. The board does a self-assessment. The board then assesses the chief executive. The chief executive assesses, assesses the senior staff members, their direct reports. Those senior staff members then assess their direct reports. So it just becomes part of the life cycle of the organization because far too often we will hear from chief executives who say, yeah, I haven't been reviewed in five years. So create, again, create a structure. Um, and we know it's not easy, right? We, we, we recognize that thinking about the organization beyond the current chief executive is challenging. You know, we're human. 
um, chief executives personify the organization, right? They become the face of the organization. And, you know, this part here in orange, Lindsay and I see it all the time, the difficulty in separating the person from the position, especially when a chief executive serves for a long time. And, you know, it can be, you know, for the chief executives on the call, it can be difficult to release control and allow others to shine. Great, so we're gonna go through a couple of leadership questions um, that are important to consider. Um, so these questions are broken up. This first one, um, they're all, you know, they, they lead to culture, but the first one is about the organization as a whole. So these questions, you know, are for, you know, any person in the organization from the chief executive to the board, to senior staff. So the first one is, does your organizational culture align with the culture of inquiry? And is that a value of your organization? Um, are staff members comfortable being honest with the chief executive? What does that line of communication look like? Um, is there um, is, is the chief executive approachable? Um, and is there honesty there? Are there concerns about um, insubordination, gossip, betrayal, loyalty, and things of that nature that go on that cause for a very, very toxic culture? Um, and is confidentiality always maintained? And do you know staff feel that their confidentiality and is valued? Mm -hmm. So when you think about these questions, we wanted to give them to you. Obviously, feel free to put questions in the Q&A if you want us to dive into any of these. But we really design these to be reflective so that you can think about these, you know, go back, think about your organization. You know, if you if you say to yourself in that third bullet, yeah, like I've seen, you know, if you're a staff member or you're a board member and you say, yeah, I've seen our chief executive like you know, really kind of push back when someone tries to shine or, you know, yeah, I, you know, our organization is ripe with gossip or, you know, you know, people are afraid to speak truth to the chief executive because, you know, of a command and control kind of environment. These are all things for you to think about. If you're a board member, if you're a staff member, if you yourself, you're the executive director and you say to yourself, yeah, that maybe, Maybe my team isn't being honest with me. We want you to think about, okay, now that we know that, how can we solve for this? How can we create a healthier environment? Great. Um, so the, these next set of questions are all centered around the chief executive. So first, does the chief executive welcome feedback and invite crucial conversation? Um, you know, similar before, is there a culture of honesty and openness? You know, and, and as part of a review process, you can discuss their, you know, the, the staff members' feelings about the communication and the flow of communication and organization. And you, so you can try to address some of these even in a review process as well. Um, does the chief executive elevate senior staff with board members and externally? And this is what we spoke to earlier. You know, it, it's okay for the chief executive to invite senior staff to attend board meetings. You could have them make presentations at board meetings. Um, you know, you don't want the board to be micromanaging the staff in any way, but you certainly want them, again, building that rapport with the senior leadership. So help elevate the senior staff by, you know, letting them present to the board, um, attend the board meetings and be present there. Um, will the chief executive feel threatened by identifying a possible successor? Um, is that something the chief executive doesn't feel comfortable with, um, this whole discussion of a possible successor? And then our performance reviews completed regularly. And again, that's really critical because so many of these conversations can also be embedded into regular reviews and can be addressed there. And that way it doesn't get out of hand that the culture becomes something um, that you wouldn't want it to be. And Lindsay, I'll, that third bullet, you know, we spend a lot of time working with directors of development and advancement directors and senior staff members who that third bullet is real. Um, where they feel like the chief executive feels threatened by their growth or their success or when they get elevated or when they get, you know, rewarded or recognized. And so that's a big one to reflect on as you think about that, because that's really, really difficult when we're talking about mentoring, we're talking about growth and professional development. You have to ensure that the chief executive will create the environment to allow that to happen and not squash it because they suddenly feel threatened. Yeah. 
And I think even with the first one about, you know, inviting feedback in crucial conversations, you know, we've heard sometimes criticisms of senior leaders that this individual is very intelligent. They're super smart. They're right most of the time, but they don't invite in the conversation. They go out with the assumption that they're right. And there's no, there's no conversation happening. There's not communication. There's no feedback loop. Um, and that's really, really detrimental to a culture. Yeah, for sure. So the last group of questions here is about the board and for the board to consider here. Um, first, again, does the board have familiarity with senior leaders, senior, senior staff and senior leaders? And, and is there an opportunity to build rapport with those senior staff? The second one, how engaged is the board in the life and the health of the organization? Um, will the board allow staff members to participate in chief executive search process when the time comes? And this is really, really important. We're, we're seeing a lot of organizations through their succession plannings. In advance, we really advise that they um, outline what their search committee would look like. How many board members would sit on the committee? How many, and if any, external stakeholders would sit on the committee? But it's also important to have at least a, one senior leader sitting on the committee because they have a different perspective of the executive director role of the culture of the organization. There's so much value that, that internal senior staff member is can bring to a search committee. So um, one, you know, it's important to ask, will the board allow staff members to participate in that search process when the time does come? Yeah. Um, and, I, and, we've, and we've even seen, you know, searches happen where there is not that senior staff um, participation. Um, and the staff were very, very upset by the outcome of who was selected as the chief executive. And th they have this feeling that there was no participation in the process, um, which then again leads to really low staff morale. It can lead to turnover. Um, so that senior staff involvement is really, really critical. Oh, 100%. And it can also create the really bad outcome of the board is, if the board only is talking to the candidates. The board's perception of the job may be very different than the reality of the job. And so the quote we hear often is, you know, the job I interviewed for is not the job that I have because the board was out of touch. They weren't engaged in the life and health of the organization. Staff didn't inform the job description or the process in any way. And that's just such a horrible outcome because the new hire is not then set up for success. And, you know, we're working with a client that, or we have worked with a client who feels very strongly about their staff being engaged in these kind of leadership decisions. Um, and they really felt strongly that when the time comes for a search, the staff should be able to meet the top candidates, the full staff. And so we, we talked through that with them. And that I don't, we don't think that there's a right or wrong answer here, but you do have to be very thoughtful about how that process is run. So if you run a town hall scenario where staff can meet the, the, the candidates, you know, does the staff think they have decision-making making authority in that? Um, which is very different than a meet and greet with candidates. You know, what is the feedback loop gonna, gonna look like between the staff um, and the search committee, you know, are they, is there going to be an opportunity to, for them to share feedback? So this participation in the set search process for staff, um, is, it's really important to clarify what that looks like ahead of time, um, because it can get really tricky. Yeah. Managing expectations, right? That's right. That's exactly right. So we'll move to closing because we want to get to Q and A. Um, and so we always want to close with a quote. So this was from an executive director who we were working on succession planning with. And when it came time to think about this candidate identification conversation internally, she was paralyzed. She was absolutely paralyzed. And she said, I can't possibly identify one internal candidate. I don't want to disrupt the leadership team. As Lindsay said earlier, this was someone who valued harmony. Um, to a great extent. And it was, I mean, it, Lindsay and I would watch her body language. You know, we, we had multiple conversations with her. She literally couldn't say, I think Bill, you know, would be a great candidate uh, for X reasons. She just felt like doing that was going to change the culture, change the morale of the organization. And we kept trying to say to her, this is not selection, right? You are not endorsing, you are not appointing. It is about you thinking about your senior team, sharing those thoughts with the board, right? Sharing your thoughts with the staff members so that they can have leadership development growth and, and you know, potential. 
um, but it paralyzed her. So if this, all of this conversation today sounds to you like this is gonna be hard to do, no, again, we are human, but don't let it consume you with fear because this is not appointing your successor. This is not selection. I also think it's really important to note, and we didn't add this in a slide, but we've also seen fear and anxiety around the, the flip of this, right? Where they don't think there is an internal candidate. And I think it's really important to note that that is okay too. These are all considerations, but it is, it is, it is very often that we see that there aren't internal candidates that are necessarily identified and that's okay. I was trying to do some quick research earlier around what percent of nonprofits are bringing internal candidates to a transition process. And the data is over several years, but it, it really averaged out to about 30%, which is super interesting because our first question was how many of you have internal candidates that are interested and it was 30%. So there are still sometimes two thirds of organizations that don't have identified um, internal candidates as potential chief executives. So it's also okay um, if you don't have an internal candidate that you think is ready. That's right. And if you don't let the board know that, right? Yeah. I mean, that's all this whole is everything, all these sessions that we're doing is all about preparedness. You know, far better for the board to know that today there are no internal candidates. That's a crucial piece of information. So we want to bring Danielle back and we will move to our QA time. Wow, that was that was rich. And I so appreciate that there was a mix there of um, systematic approaches and the, of course, natural emotional approach that you would need to take in these matters. So for the folks in our audience, this is a great time to plop questions into the Q&A box. We have a couple in there already right now. Um, I want to start off by asking this. Can you talk us through when we should begin identifying these internal internal candidates? Um, is it right at the point where you think, oh, I need to leave? Or should we have cultivated these pipelines years in advance? Yeah. Lindsay, do you want to take that one first? Well, I, I think that this all kind of goes to the importance, honestly, of the early documentation of professional development goals. We, we've started this with some clients who say, oh, I don't need to embed these questions into our reviews because we don't have anyone interested right now. Well, it really should be systematic. And so that these things are, you know, someone could from year to year could change their mind on their leadership goals or their aspirations. So I don't think it's ever too early to start embedding into review process. What are your leadership aspirations? Where do you want to go with this position? And how can I help you get there? So, you know, in my opinion, that formal piece of the process is never um, too early to start. Yeah. And, you know, Danielle, as we, we gave everyone the reminder of those leadership scenarios, not all departures are planned, right? Someone may be thinking, I'm not going to retire for another five years. We have time to do this. Well, a health condition, you know, diagnosis can happen tomorrow. And so all of these sessions that we're doing, it's about preparedness and planning. So we would encourage every chief executive that's on this Zoom to start thinking about having these conversations with your team. Um, for me, the, when I asked that question, that was somewhat of a loaded question because I wanted to say explicitly that this has to be an evolutionary process with your team. It cannot be um, one of the, this is not emergency planning. This is um, overtime planning. Um, so we have some really good questions in the chat right now. And so I will pivot to those. I'm going to read this, Danielle. I'll add one more thing to what you were just saying. It is evolutionary, also authentic, right? When it's evolutionary, it is authentic rather than uh, check the box. I need to ask you this question because the board wants to know if we have an internal candidate. So I just wanted to add that to your comment. Then it's much more authentic when it's when it's over time. I can appreciate that because it's an, along with a process of getting to know your senior leaders. Um, and really investing in what's important to them in their career development. So that authenticity is gonna be built in there. So we have um, a question that I will read directly just to make sure I can get the crux of that in there. Our board operates with the Carver model of board governance. Since the board understands that the CEO manages the organization and does not want to get involved in staff matters, Having the staff attend board meetings is not viewed positively. 
And what is, in light of what you shared, how would you respond to this? Yep. So I, I'll take a stab at this first, Lindsay, then I'll let you jump in. So um, yes, we, we understand the Carver model um, very well. We certainly have other clients who follow the Carver model. And I think there's a distinction between having staff attend board meetings and having staff present expert opinion knowledge to the board. So for instance, um, even with a Carver model or not, every board meeting should have kind of a theme for, you know, what strategic initiative are we gonna talk about in this meeting? Or what policy are we gonna talk about? So, you know, if there's, if there's a strategic initiative that you want to talk about in terms of a you know, potential, um, you know, shift in um, programming because the outcomes data in your program is telling you as an organization, you need to pivot because the needs of the people that you're serving have changed. You bring in that program staff member to make a presentation to the board on, here's the data that we've been collecting. Here's what we're seeing. Here's our analysis of it. And here's why we need to pivot. So you're bringing those staff members in at a, at, um, from a knowledge um, standpoint. It gives the board a sense of who on the team plays what role. Um, and then they can exit the board meeting and then the board and the chief executive can then have their debate or that person can stay and be a part of the debate. But I think there's just showing up and sitting on the sidelines of a board meeting. And then there's actually you know, presenting and being engaged in strategic thinking and discussion and debate. Yeah, I agree. But I also think that elevating your staff goes far beyond a board meeting, right? So I do think it's on the executive director to be elevating their senior leadership in a multitude of ways that extend beyond a board meeting itself. Whether, like what we mentioned, is it allowing a podium? Is it the executive director, even if the staff member isn't at a board meeting, giving credit and praise to a staff member that helped create something that's being presented or that accomplished something for the organization. It really, if, if that's the, if that's the model, then I think it's there's more weight on that executive director to elevate their staff members personally be elevating them to the board um, and, and giving them the, you know, the recognition and, you know, attention that they sort of deserve. All right, so we have another question here in the chat box, and it says, um, to what extent would you su um, excuse me, suggest discussing transition planning with your senior leadership team as a group? Um, would the answer be different for emergency succession planning versus long-term succession planning? So, so yes, yeah, so emergency, um, so our first um, bit of advice is you have to do the emergency planning first, right? You have to be prepared for the unforeseen, the unplanned, the thing that could happen today at three o'clock that nobody was anticipating. And emergency preparedness planning has to come first. And often that includes more senior staff members because you're thinking about different scenarios, who has the passwords and usernames, who has the keys, you know, all of those details. But ultimately, all of this planning, all succession planning, whether it's first step of emergency or this multi-step process for long-term is a function of board governance. It is a board's responsibility and it is the board working with the chief executive to do this and you bring in members of the senior team as needed. So for instance, when it's time to talk about what your crisis communications plan is gonna be, you're gonna need your director of marketing. But you, this, isn't, this whole process is not driven by the staff. Um, you want the staff to be informed. You know, this is not to be opaque, this is to be transparent, but it was really about building board capacity. Because at the end of the day, when a chief executive leaves, the board launches the search. The more the board understands the organization, understands the job of the CEO, understands current state and the dynamics and the politics and the players, the far better outcomes of that search. So you don't want all the knowledge to live with just the staff. 
Um, and I think I, if you were, if you were going to share in a group setting with the staff, I think it would be there's a clarifying a lot of the confusions that exist around succession planning. So if you go back to our level set slide, that would be the perfect amount of information to share with your staff. Right? This is a proactive process. It doesn't mean the chief executive is leaving right away. You know, there is no selection. This is identification. You know, all of those fundamentals are just help take down the anxiety and also you know create a level playing field with the staff so that they understand the process because like like many of us when they people hear succession planning they think about search transition successors um and and you don't want the staff to be jumping to those kind of conclusions too so helpful to have that broader conversation i'll add to that lindsay we have a client danielle who did in the emergency preparedness part of succession planning determined who the acting chief would be, which is one member of the leadership team, and then determined who the second, like the backup acting chief would be if that first person was unavailable. So the person that they determined who the act, who would be acting chief if the current executive director becomes incapacitated in an emergency situation, that staff member wanted to call her entire department together to notify them of this. And Lindsay and I said, no, 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 slow down. Again, this is not selection. This does not mean tomorrow you are now deputy chief. No, this is an if-then scenario. If the current executive director is incapacitated, if there's an emergency, you will serve as an acting chief. Because Lindsay's exactly right. We don't want to suddenly create anxiety. We don't want rumors to start flying. So this was much less about notifying her team and much more about reminding everybody that we're putting plans in place should something happen. So I want to go back to one aspect of the um, answer, the question that was asked. Um, so we, we've identified the difference between emergency versus long-term planning. And I think, I'm assuming, but I think what the crux of this question was is in the, um, culture of an egal egalitarian leader who would like to provide opportunities to the entire leadership team. Should this be a conversation that is brought up and, and as maybe even agenda item at a leadership team meeting to talk about whether this is who would like to be considered or whether you, if you would like to be considered, this is how you notify, that sort of thing. Yeah. What do you think? Well, I was going to say, I, I certainly think that a, a leadership team meeting would be a great place to do a level set for succession planning. I personally think that the who's interested, who's identified is, is again, in that review process. That's more a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Now, certainly you could let the staff know that there will be an outlet for those conversations and that those would be one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but, you know, I, I, would, I don't know that I would do that in the public forum, but certainly a, a leadership meeting to make sure that everyone has the basic understanding is what the process means. What is an acting chief versus an interim? Do they understand that that emergency preparedness, that chief role looks very different in long-term planning? Um, and all, you know, like we've mentioned before, we have uh, clients whose acting chief has absolutely zero interest in ever being the chief executive, but they're the best person for an emergency situation. So having, making sure that those elements are all understood would be great for a leadership team meeting, but the one-on-one -on -one identification and interest, I think is a personal conversation. I agree. And I think, Danielle, that egalitarian leader in that senior leadership team could share, share a personal story, like the story that I shared early in my career, you know, that was so formative to me when someone said, I see promise in you, and a board member took me out to lunch. And so an egalitarian leader can share a, you know, a personal story and then say to everybody, and I want to make sure everyone on this leadership team knows that I care about your growth. You know, so we'll have one-on-one -on -one conversations to talk about what, where you see your, your career going. Also for me to say to you where I see your career going, you know, where I see you flourishing. So I, I think the balance would be important, but I think Lindsay's exactly right. Keep the details to that in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Thank you for clarifying that. I think that was probably the fundamental ask in that um, question is how do we make sure that we are going about this in a way that doesn't feel like picking favorites? And so I think you um, addressed that nicely. We have an additional question in the Q&A box. Um, it is, what do you think about a CEO staying on with an organization in a new role when the new leader 
takes their position. Yeah. No. <laughs> Well, but Carrie, but I mean, we see this. I mean, that's a great, great question in very real world. So in our succession planning process, one of the key elements of it is defining all the terms of the search process. Like I said, mentioned before, who sits on the committee, how many external, internal board members, stakeholders, et cetera. What is the role of the current executive director in that search? Are they on the committee? Are they, are they giving suggestions on who should be candidates? Are they reviewing resumes? And then in addition to that, how long does that chief executive stay on in overlap with the new um, chief executive? So is there, you know, in terms of the overlap, we, we really recommend that be a month or less. You really don't want a long overlap. We have, we have clients that have literally said a maximum of one day because they just, that, they said they'll greet them at the door and then they'll wish them luck. Um, now, this question I know is slightly different because it said in a new role, right? So it's not necessarily an overlap as just a transitioning out, but um, it can be really tricky. So I think first it's going to depend on what is the new role. Um, and, and we have seen this too, where if the new role is still this very forward facing role for the organization, are you still doing the donor relations? Are you still doing all the public relations? then the organization really has trouble getting away from that individual being the face of an organization. And in my personal opinion, the, the new chief executive, you're, they're losing credibility over time because people are still going to that old executive director for all of those forward-facing things. So, you know, it's very tricky. So I would say we don't recommend it in most situations because it, it doesn't work well um, in elevating that new executive director in their role. It's so problematic. So any chief executive who's on here and you're thinking about retirement or you're thinking about a transition and you say to yourself, I love this mission so much. You know what, if I, if I took X role, then I could still be involved in the organization. I'm like, no, move on. It's not healthy. It creates so many dynamics um, of short transition, like Lindsay said, like less than a month, a couple of weeks, and then move on. And if we're following along with you on this journey of the series that you're providing, we know that you planned well in advance for your departure. You have everything you need to hand off and provide that new leader what they need to hit the ground running. Um, and you can let go of your organization feeling secure that you have done your part. Yeah. That's absolutely right. And I also do think that you we you could consider, especially if you're a founder or someone, being having a board position, right? So that you do see that in the for-profit world, right? You know, a CEO steps down and they become chair of the board. So that's something to consider because as a board member, once again, you're staying out of the operations and you're really focused on the strategy. Um, and so if you think you could take yourself out of the weeds and sit as a board member, that's another potential way to stay involved without um, disrupting necessarily that new person coming into the role as chief executive. And, it, and as Lindsay said, this is this question, Danielle, is really hard for founders. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the slides that we had earlier, you know, we had one of the bullets was, you know, separating the, the person from the position. And that is often an issue with a founder that it's like, it's one and the same, right? Susie is the organization and no one can see someone other than Susie in that role. And so, um, especially for founders or very long serving CEOs, it's just so much healthier to move on. Yeah, even in that board chair position, it's really having the self-awareness <laughs> to be able to say, I can remove myself from daily operations. So that's a delicate situation. Um, so one of the themes that I picked up on throughout your presentation is that you have truly systematized the process down to um, how we um, cultivate relationships, how we go about mentorship, um, and how we uh, essentially bring our uh, nonprofit leaders to our board as an introduction, if you will. Um, I am wondering for our smaller nonprofit organizations that have more of a flat, um, flat leadership line, how do you begin cultivating these relationships with maybe an, an organization that only has a few uh, even staff members? Yeah, so I can think of a client right now that's a very small staff. And 
um, to your point, Danielle, about flat, I often have to remind that board that while it is a flat structure, there still is just one chief executive. So what's happening at that organization, it's, it's almost like everybody reports to the board because it's so small. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the board will go to, you know, Susie and say, what's your opinion on this when, you know, Sally is the CEO. So even in a small flat organization, there is a little bit of a hierarchy, right? There is one chief executive and that whether that, whether your title is executive director or general manager or CEO, right? There's one chief executive mm -hmm. and that one chief executive builds the relationship with the board and manages the staff, even if it's a small staff. So even if you're flat, remember there's just one chief executive. And then that chief executive, executive director, general manager, whatever the title is, has to think about, okay, even though we're flat and we don't have departments, we just have one person in each of these spots, you know, what is that person's, you know, leadership development as well? But I would just, I would be cautious to, think about it as purely flat when there's still just as one person with the authority to be the chief executive. And I also think too, that we, you could, we can open our minds a little bit to what mentoring looks like, even if it's flat, um, maybe you're mentoring based on tenure and you've got someone who's been in an organization for a very long time who can help serve as a mentor to someone who's new to the organization. So it's not necessarily on the executive director, maybe their titles are similar, but they have more experience at that organization or in that field. So mentorship, you know, we can maybe, you know, broaden how we think of mentorship too. Um, and it doesn't have to all fall on the chief executive, even in a flat organization. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, so we get a lot of, in our audience, leaders, executive directors, CEOs, that's uh, primary folks who join us typically. And so you talked about the emotions involved in succession planning in identifying potential candidates. And in the presentation, you spoke from the perspective of both the possibly identified candidate and possibly also the board um, member. But I'm wondering if you are coaching an executive director or CEO, how are you coaching them through those emotions? Yeah, and they're real. I mean, the one example that we gave with that quote where this, this chief executive was just kind of paralyzed with these decisions. It's real, we're human. Um, you know, one of the transition scenarios is, is illness or death. I mean, that's just not an easy thing to talk about. Like I might die and then what happens to this organization? Like this is, right, we're not, we have to be really cognizant of how weighty some of these conversations are. So it's a great question, Danielle, because we have to come at this from a very humanistic standpoint, right? And we have to acknowledge that this is hard. We have to, we have to acknowledge that there's fear and there's an anxiety and a level of unknown, um, you know, that can be really just difficult to grasp. So we have to approach this then, you know, again, from that very humanistic standpoint and be the the guide and be the support person for the chief executive who has to think about these things with, with his or her board. And, you know, sometimes that relationship between the chief executive and the board is not positive. It's not strong, or maybe there's, there's some fracture, or maybe there's some mistrust, you know, maybe there's some betrayal that's happened at some point. So we just have to be, you know, just very cognizant of all of these layers of complexity and that's why, you know, Lindsay and I and our team have this very systematic process to go through it, like step by step, so that it doesn't become so overwhelming that it paralyzes. It's like, okay, today we're going to think about making this decision, or we're going to reflect on this topic. And we do this work over months with a client. This is not work you can do in weeks. This is work that takes six, seven months to do. So when you're working with an executive director or CEO and you recognize that the challenge might be they may be having a difficult time letting go or letting their um, junior staff have the mic, so to speak, how do you coach a CEO through that? Mm -hmm. um, we all, often bring it back to personal experience and stories. Mm -hmm. And we will ask, we will start to ask probing questions. So one of one of the ways 
that we are counselors is to ask more questions. So, you know, tell me more about that. Tell me more um, about what you're thinking if Bill has the mic at the podium. Um, tell me your thoughts about that. And we, we use those probing questions to see what can we get to the root of? You know, was there, and, and I will tell you like sadly, there are many executive directors who are cautious because there have been some, there was some betrayal. There was some issue that happened with the board or there was some issue that happened with a staff member. And you know, the cliche of once bitten twice shy. So now they're just like very anxious because they don't want that thing to happen again. So we, we try to get to the root of it. Like what happened? What, tell us more about that. Tell us what you're thinking, what happened? so that we can then navigate it and be and, and bring some challenges to the foreground. I will quickly tell you, we had a chief executive literally tell us that a board member hired a private investigator. I mean, you can't make this up because they felt like something was going on and talk about betrayal. And now, obviously that is an extreme scenario but imagine how this director felt after she found out that that happened. So again, that is an extreme circumstance, but little even microaggressions, there are little things that can happen. So we try to walk with them through that, navigate that. And then we have to, as you know, Lindsay said earlier, those crucial conversations, then we have to bring the truth forward to the board. We have to allow a chief executive and executive director to stand in their truth and then help the organization um, be aware of it, navigate it, and walk past to get through it to the other side. Yeah, and just stepping back to your, I think you're a little bit earlier question, Danielle, about the anxiety and helping bring it down and all the emotions. You know, obviously we can't eliminate them, but I will say that preparedness helps immensely with anxiety. And we um, recently working on a succession plan for a beloved leader, and we did this full findings report of what do all the external and internal stakeholders want in the next leader, and what do they see, and what do they value, and what do they prioritize, and what relationships are important. And they were blown away by the thoroughness of this, and it pr provided so much comfort for the current executive director in knowing that all of this research had been done, that it was really clear what they were looking for, that everyone was in alignment, and that that took the pressure off him to, you know, bring that forward. And so I, all to say, I just it's just the, the critical nature of being prepared and doing this work in advance is going to be the number one thing that's going to bring down the anxiety and emotion involved. And that executive director was so anxious about this, Danielle, about this work that the scope of work was delayed three times. And that's the other thing. We will never force an organization into this, right? We needed to make sure that that executive director was in the right headspace to get into the work. Now, at some point you have to just say, let's go. <laughs> but um, if it was, if we had forced the timeline earlier, I don't know that he'd be in the right headspace, the headspace that he's in now. There is a tremendous amount um, of respect that needs to be paid to the emotional aspects of leadership. Um, and within that, the, the need for self-awareness that is largely developed over time, but knowing yourself, you know, having those thought experiments about how you will feel when cert certain situations take place so that you know in advance I can expect these feelings to arise. I know what I need to do to mitigate those. So this was, I think, a really beneficial forum because it, it helps us to address the fact that we have to come to terms with the fact that our emotions do play a role in our work. They cannot be avoided. Right. Um, so we are at time right now. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to share? To say, and to that, to that, Danielle, for everyone on the Zoom, and it's okay to be vulnerable. It is. There is no other way to make sure that you are countering and factoring in those emotions aside from being honest and vulnerable about them. When we start stuffing them away, that's when they pop out in ways that we don't want them to. Yes. Thank you so, so much for bringing your expertise to us again today. I'm excited for the last forums that we have with you coming up over the next few months. So please keep an eye out in your inboxes for those forums to come out 
Also check out the ones that happened previously and the Dropbox link so that you have access to all the great um, content that has happened over time. Um, and join us again next time. Thank you so much for attending. Take care. Thank you.